We finished our last session being pretty happy with the newton raphson method. After all, it gave us a very accurate result. It got there very fast, and it did so regardless of whether you gave it a good starting value or not. So it was stable, it was robust, and it was quick. Now, you couldn't really ask for anything more. But we also ended last session wondering if there could be something that would go wrong with this method. And we said, yeah, there, there was. You know, there, there are some problems that could happen. And there are two situations that we have to watch. The first one is that most nonlinear equations have multiple roots. The newton raphson algorithm will only chase down one. And the one that it chases down is going to be the one that's near your starting position. Now that's a fairly easy problem to fix because if we just graph it we'll know where the roots are roughly and we can pick the root that we're most interested in. And by the way some roots won't have an application to your engineering problem and other roots may have interpretive value. Yogi Berra once said that you can tell a lot just by looking. and We find that here in the requirement that we really need to graph our problems out before we look for solutions. Now the second issue that comes up is a little more subtle, and that is in the formula itself. We are dividing by a derivative. That derivative might be zero. And if that happens, we're going to be guaranteed to run into trouble. But that is going to be something that's pretty easy for us to check in advance. Let's return to the quadratic that produced our square root and look at the whole curve a little more critically. When I was giving you examples of starting points, I was pretty careful to limit myself to positive values only. Sometimes we had a very large positive value that we used as a guess, and sometimes we had a really tiny one that we used, but they were all positive. If we had used negative values, we would have converged into a different root. In fact, it would have been the mirror image of our positive root. In that case, we'd say, okay, I see what's happening, uh, not really any problem. We're starting from some point and our tangent line is pointing either negative or positive, depending on which side of the vertical axis we're on. But other functions aren't quite as simple as this one. You could have a function that was uh, changing its behavior as you're getting towards some limiting value, you might get a real rapid oscillation, or you just might get several very dissimilar roots. We should take a look at that negative value and see what happens. And I don't think we're going to be very surprised. If we start with a minus 5 rather than a plus 5, the numeric value of these, these converging numbers uh, all look just like they did before, except the sign is switched. So that's pretty easy. But what if we change the problem? Let's say we're going after a cube root now instead of a square root. Well, our function that we want to find the root for is going to be a cubic. Take the cube root of a and you're going to get zero when you plug it into that function right there. Stepping back for a moment and looking at this cubic a little bit more analytically, uh, there is a different behavior that's going on with the quadratic. A quadratic will always have two roots. You'll either have two complex roots, or one real root, or two real roots. In the case of a cubic, you'll always get at least one real root. Now, this form of the newton raphson method only goes after real roots. So let's, let's go ahead and try this and see where it ends up. If we're going to apply the newton raphson algorithm, we need to take the derivative, uh, just as usual, and then we will plug in x sub n into the right side of the newton raphson formula and, and come up with our iterative uh, equation. So let's make those substitutions and see what we get. And we have something that looks just as problematic as we initially did with our quadratic. And that is that we have some negative values that are scaring us, in particular this one, which will end up resulting in the difference of two similar numbers as you get close to the root. But the way to handle this is exactly the same as with the quadratic. You form a common denominator by multiplying x sub n uh, top and bottom by 3x sub n squared, and that then puts everything in nice common form, 
We still want to get rid of these subtractions, but that's easy to do, turning the first one into 2x sub n cubed, and we'll get a positive a, since a minus times a minus is a positive, positive value. Now it looks like I can apply this thing exactly the same way I did before, and in fact, uh, we can. This one real root does exist. If we try that in a table, uh, we're going to end up getting a rapid convergence like we hoped. Start off with the same bad value, it converges in quickly. Well, it ends, runs into a little trouble at first, interestingly enough, but as you get close enough, then it just zips into the right solution. So I think we're pretty happy with this algorithm of finding a cube root. It would be worth taking a look at what's happened graphically. Here is our function, our cubic, and we were starting with a very high value for an x, so we're way off the chart. We'd create a tangent line that would shoot down into the horizontal axis and give us a better starting value, and then we get even a better uh, tangent line and get yet a better yet value, and we converge reasonably well. If we had started with a negative value, we would have shot right across into the positive quadrant, and the same thing would have happened. So this is going to be okay, but the reason it's okay is the slope near the root is not zero. Let's change the problem a bit and give us a problematic formula where the slope is zero near the root. Here we have simply changed the equation to be x minus five quantity cubed and the root will be x equal to five. So what is going to happen with the derivative? Well, let's go ahead and compute it in the same way we normally do. Here's our cubic, here's our derivative, and quite clearly as x approaches its root, meaning x approaches a, this derivative is going to zero. So now I'm a little bit worried because I've got to set up my Newton-Raphson algorithm and I'm dividing by a, uh, a number that's going to get closer and closer to zero. Here's what it will look like, but putting it in this form makes me feel better because I realize I can cancel out anything that's going to cause me trouble, in particular, this x sub n minus a squared. So let's do that. We'll also continue to do the common denominator idea, and if we multiply through by the negative sign, it seems like we're back in happy land again because we don't have any problematic subtractions, and we've, we've gotten away from the issue of any impact of a first derivative that's equal to zero, or so we think. It's still hiding there because the first derivative is zero at the root, whether I like it or not. I've just created a nice formula to avoid uh, dividing by zero at an inappropriate time. Let's turn that into our pseudocode, and uh, it looks a lot like we had before. The only thing that's different is the, is the Newton-Raphson uh, equation itself that will be producing cubics. Okay, sounds good. Let's see how it actually works in practice. Now I've gone back to the same format I've had earlier, comparing the bisection method to the Newton-Raphson iteration. And if you just run it out, uh, the, the uh, bisection method converges in about the time you expect, but the Newton-Raphson algorithm actually does worse. Now that's that's nervous. We thought this was going to be our premier method. And take a look at the error difference between these two. Uh, it's it's uh, not good. So if we take a look at how fast this is converging, in this case relative to f, then we find out the Newton-Raphson algorithm is actually doing worse. You can even see that here, that the, the solution has reached five to about five decimal places and Newton-Raphson hasn't gotten there yet. So why did that happen? Well, the reason is even though we created formulas that were numerically stable, they still have the same property that the slope is equal to zero as you're getting close to the root. If you want to see what is going on here, think about the Taylor series itself. When we created our Taylor series, we truncated it after the linear term. That gave us an error uh, which was quadratic or second order. But in this particular problem, our derivative is approaching zero, which means this 
portion of the predictive equation isn't doing hardly anything, and I am going to be moving very slowly towards a uh, solution. What we could do instead, which we won't, and I won't even give this to you on a homework problem, is we could go one more term, and we could uh, use our predictive formula to include a squared term. And then uh, the error term, of course, would be third order. And we would need to do something like that if we wanted to rescue our Newton-Raphson algorithm from having this flat slope. Now, even though I am not going to hold you accountable for a second order Newton-Raphson-like example, uh, I am going to hold you accountable for other homework, so let's move off to our homework page and see what we can do. We're going to use the computer exercises this time in section 3.2. We'll start with problem 4 and uh, just do it exactly like it indicates, and that'll be worth 10 points. Uh, then we're going to uh, go back to the notes and use the cube root polynomial, and we'll apply it just like we did in the example, defining the cube root of 5. I do want you to get 15 full significant digits and when you do report the relative error and the number of iterations it took you to get to the Newton-Raphson method. When I say report I mean calculate. I can check that when I receive your code and run it. Finally as extra credit if you do problem 3.2, problem 15 uh, that could be worth an extra 10 points as well. So let's close this out. We're almost done with Newton-Raphson now. We're pretty happy with it. There's a few more things I want to say about it in section 3.2d, and there's some ways that it can be generalized in some pretty interesting manner. So with that, uh, we'll, we'll end this session, and, and we'll see you next time.